so the problem that the church faced was that the uh, the people who were resistant to Galileo were churchmen who had married their theology to Aristotle. You know they they had they had married the the teaching of the Bible to the best science of the day when they were going through seminary, mm-hmm. and then. Galileo came along and disruptively. So the lesson ought to be, the lesson that's urged upon us is always believe science over faith, but the lesson ought to be actually don't let your faith get co-opted by the current science, because he who marries the science of the day is going to be a widow tomorrow. Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance of Men. My name is Will Spencer. This week, I'm pleased to host a very special episode. We're taking a break from current events to focus on literature and an important but overlooked work from one of the most important authors in the Christian faith, C.S. Lewis. We'll be talking about his Space Trilogy, more accurately known as the Ransom Trilogy. And joining me for my first three-way conversation, I'm honored to host Christiana Hale, author of Deeper Heaven, a reader's guide to the C.S. Lewis Ransom Trilogy, and returning to the podcast from Christkirk in Moscow, Idaho, Pastor Doug Wilson. Pastor Doug and Christiana were amazing teachers in helping me understand these books, and for that I'm eternally grateful. Because I believe that these books might be the most important ones that Christians can read today that most have never heard of. Yes, perhaps even more important than Middle Earth or Narnia. Because we're not in a political war or a culture war, but a religious war. And beneath that religious war, I believe, is a cosmological war, or a battle between cosmologies. Culture has provided its answer, the Big Bang, empty space, and evolution. Meanwhile, what has been the Christian response? There hasn't been one. The battleground of science fiction has been ceded to secular and pagan minds without a fight. We go from culture straight to the top floor of theology and neglect the pressing and obvious question, what about all that stuff up there in the night sky? How does it play a role? And what does it have to say about God and us? Well, it turns out that C.S. Lewis already answered those questions 80 years ago. And I'm grateful that Pastor Doug and Christiana are here to help us unpack them. If you enjoy the Renaissance of Men podcast, thank you. Don't forget to like this video, share, and subscribe. And leave a comment letting us know what you thought. Quick note, this conversation is full of spoilers pretty much right away. But I promise... Nothing can take from you the experience of reading the books and seeing yourself, humanity, modernity, and Christ's cosmic story reflected in the glow. So please welcome this week's guests on the Renaissance of Men podcast, the author of Deeper Heaven, a reader's guide to the C.S. Lewis Ransom trilogy, Christiana Hale, and from Christ Kirk in Moscow, Idaho, Pastor Doug Wilson. Pastor Doug Wilson and Christiana Hale, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank yeah, you for happy having to be here. You. So in, in my journey as a Christian, reading the Ransom Trilogy this summer was probably one of the most important touch points for me, along with reading Simply Christian by uh, N.T. Wright, uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, and of course, my baptism. It impacted me very powerfully, and anyone who's been listening to the podcast for the past few months has known that I've pretty much been talking about it constantly. So I've been thrilled uh, at the opportunity to talk to you guys about the Ransom Trilogy and Christianity, your book, Deeper Heaven, as well. Yeah, happy to do it. <laughs> okay, so um, so let's uh, let's start, uh, Pastor Doug. I wonder if you could start by orienting uh, the Ransom trilogy in C.S. Lewis's overall catalog, uh, catalog. and then uh, Christiane, I wonder if you could also say a bit about um, what inspired you to write Deeper Heaven. Okay, so the um, Lewis had an an astonishing range. He wrote. Uh, books in his academic discipline. He wrote popular apologetic books. Um, he made his name with screw tape letters. That's what launched him into the big time. Uh, but that was sort of a fanciful apologetic or teaching mm-hmm. to people broadly. Then books like Mere Christianity and the Problem of Pain and Miracles were sort of like a theological apologetic. Uh, and then he did Narnia, Children's Lit. And then he did fiction for adults, and adult fiction was is largely made up of the Ransom trilogy, and Till We Have Faces. Um, okay. And so, it, uh, there's this Lewis project that um, his fiction occupies an important part of, 
is sort of like an incarnation of all the stuff he's talking about elsewhere. Um, so the, so for example, the abolition of man, which is a, an apologetic treatise on some of the current philosophical currents in his day is a, a one kind of treatment of the same subject that he addresses in that hideous strength. And then Christian, what, what inspired you to, to write uh, deeper heaven and when did, when did you write it exactly? So it, it has been uh, a long project. It kind of, the seeds of it sprang to being when I was working on my undergraduate thesis. So that would have been back in 2014, 15, around there. And, and in that, I was, I was doing more of an argumentative thesis, a little bit narrower. I had a particular point I wanted to make about um, the Ransom Trilogy. And in the course of researching that project and reading pretty much everything I could get my hands on, I, I found that there wasn't a really good place to point a lot of people to, to say, okay, every time I get the question, why are you writing on these books? They're so weird, right? Is <laughs> the constant, the constant response I got. And then Merlin, why does Merlin show up? And they're just weird. Right. <laughs> and I was, and as I was reading and researching, I found myself continually wishing that there was kind of a just a concise one spot, one place where I could point people, especially a lot of the people I was talking to were, were homeschool moms or mm -hmm. um, my parents, parents, friends, uh, who didn't necessarily have the kind of classical background that, um, that C.S. Lewis himself had and that a lot of a lot of these authors that are writing about him had. And they're very intelligent people that want to understand, but they just didn't have all the tools. And so I, as I was doing that research and, and trying, you know, hoping uh, to find something that I could say, here, read this book and it'll help you. Uh, I couldn't, I didn't really find anything quite like that. And so when it came time to work on my graduate thesis, I decided that I wanted to write my own reader guide and kind of compile everything that I had learned throughout my years studying uh, from, from various other authors and professors and just the background and, and put it all into one place and kind of, kind of with the aim of, I, I mean, I don't know that I quite did it as well as Lewis did, but with the aim of not, um, not speaking down to people, but also not being uh, not speaking way above their heads either. I want I want it to be for the for the lay person, if you will, uh, who loves Lewis and just wants to understand what his project was and what he was trying to do with this this trilogy. Well, so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, his, his goals for the project. Then. And I think what I'd like to do is just get an overview of the the cosmological view in general, and then do a little, little bit of a guided tour through the three through the, through the three books. So let's maybe start with an overview of the, of the cosmology that he was trying to instantiate it in the books. And, and maybe I'll just ask you that question, Christian, and then we'll go to Doug. Yes. So the cosmology that I'd say there's, there are kind of two parts to the cosmology. There's the actual physical arrangement of the medieval cosmos. And then there's all of the um, following imaginative and you'd say spiritual implications, worldview implications of that cosmology. So Lewis in the trilogy doesn't actually uh, follow the physical arrangement exactly to a T uh, because he does keep our solar system in terms of the order of the planets. There's this one scene in the first book where he encounters uh, a creature on Malacandra, which is Mars, who's actually um, sculpting, uh, making a sculpture of the cosmos. And he, we see clearly in that that there's still there's this the arrangement of the planets is not following the medieval arrangement it's not in that same order so he's kind of wedding the two together i think he's using our the physical arrangement of our cosmos as we see it mm -hmm. but then infusing it with the life and spirit and uh, influence of the medieval cosmology and all of the um all of the things that you think of when you think of that, so the the various planetary figures and the influence that they work on our planet, and just it's all the whole the whole thing as a whole, um, working on our imagination, he's trying to kind of wed those two things. Now, Doug, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that medieval cosmology and how C.S. Lewis saw the yeah. cosmos from his from his background with studies. Yeah, I, I agree with what 
Christiana said entirely. Um, Lewis says at the end of his book, The Discarded Image, he makes a comment. Uh, some people might wonder why I've woven this spell when this beautiful medieval construct had one fatal defect. It wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> other, other than that, um, well, uh, Lu and Lewis grants that it, it wasn't true, but I think he's um, granting the point at the level that was just said. And those things are things that are incidental to what Lewis is trying to preserve or recover. Uh, so, for example, I like the order of the planets. Uh, the, the medieval system was geocentric as opposed to heliocentric. Um, they go to Mars in a spaceship uh, that doesn't clonk into the crystalline spheres that, <laughs> that, uh, that have the planets embedded in them. And for those of your viewers who are not aware, you've got a, in the medieval cosmology, you've got the uh, earth at this, uh, as a fixed center. And then you've got these spheres like a goldfish bowl in uh, completely surrounding it and the first level would be the moon embedded in the wall of this glass sphere mm -hmm. and and it spins and then you go the next level out and then the next level out and the next level out uh so lewis is prepared to grant to everyone yeah that's not strictly speaking physically true mm -hmm. um but uh, for example he he has planetary intelligences or angels he calls them the oyarsa that are associated with each of the uh each of the planets so it's sort of like um uh the difference between talking about a uh talking about someone that you have not met with someone else and and you're discussing how much that person weighs that's that's the configuration of the solar system as opposed to whether or not they have a soul Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right, um, right. And so Lewis is is uh, staunchly defending the idea that the the solar system is is teeming with life. It's mm -hmm. uh, there are intelligences associated with it. It's not just empty an empty vacuum with punctuated with flaming gas and and dead rock it's it's teeming with life and lewis gets that across very um forcefully and i think he's actively trying to promote that view because he really believes it so it's it's the difference between a physical map and whether eternal beings with souls live in that uh place he mm -hmm. i think lewis would say yeah they drew the map a little inaccurately but they were right about the inhabitants so let's can we go back to the heliocentric versus the geocentric model? Because like I think what what I what I picked up from your book, Christiana, was that the the heliocentric model or the, or the notion, sorry, the geocentric model, the notion that the earth is at the center of, of the cosmos, it wasn't a compliment to the earth. Like we have a hard time understanding that. Like we look at center as like, oh, that's the most important. Like, no, the earth was the least important part of the cosmos. Yes. And I think I think one way that you can see this very clearly is by looking at Dante's Divine Comedy, which uh, Lewis himself loved. It was one of his favorite, favorite books. And you look at the Inferno and ask, OK, well, what's the center? What's the center of hell? Right. And the center of hell is the devil himself. Right. That's it's the lowest. It's the lowest spot you can get. And the most central is the farthest removed from from God himself that you can get as well. Mm -hmm. And so as we kind of step out and see even further, you can see that they, they considered the earth to inhabit that same kind of location. It's, it's central, yes, but it's also the lowest spot, more like the bottom of the well sort of, sort of thing, right? Um, you're just down in the, I think I sump pump of the universe kind of, <laughs> kind of thing, really. Um, and so far, again, uh -huh. farthest removed from from the actual abode of God, which is outside of the spheres, right? You, you keep moving out and up and away and you get closer um, to, to heaven itself where, where God lives. And so I think, yeah, we, we use them. We use the phrase, you know, you think you're the center of the universe to mean like you're the most important you're, you think you're all that, but that is not, it's a complete reversal of how a medieval would have seen that spot and the import of that spot, which is, I think, really important to understanding 
a lot of what happened in the Copernican revolution and, and, and that it wasn't necessarily this movement from um, the resistance to that revolution wasn't from a kind of a weird, well, man is so important. So we have to keep man at the center, right? It wasn't, it wasn't that it was very, very, it was a different sort of thing going on than just that simplistic explanation. Doug, was it in your lectures where you talked about it was actually like two different kinds of science clashing or was that in your book, Christiana? Like there was, it was not, it wasn't science versus faith. It was some, it was some other conflict that was going on there. Yeah. I've, I've said that somewhere mm -hmm. um, where I think I not... said it in my book too. Okay, cool. <laughs> so... You both did. So um, I, I'll, I'll say something about it and maybe you can add to that, Christiana, um, where it, moderns have been taught to regard the Galileo battle as a battle between the, the between faith and science and science won out uh three cheers yay you know <laughs> yay um because the the bigoted theologians were sticking to their guns and they uh they wouldn't listen to galileo who was the pur the purveyor of new knowledge new wisdom mm -hmm. uh but it was actually a clash between the old science and the new science mm -hmm. Um, so the problem that the church faced was that the uh, the people who were resistant to Galileo were churchmen who had married their theology to Aristotle. You know they they had they had married the the teaching of the Bible to the best science of the day when they were going through seminary, mm -hmm. and then. Galileo came along and disruptively. So the lesson ought to be, the lesson that's urged upon us is always believe science over faith, but the lesson ought to be actually don't let your faith get co-opted by the current science, because he who marries the science of the day is going to be a widow tomorrow. I'm going to, I'm going to quote that right now. <laughs> Go ahead, Christian. <laughs> I, I would just echo the same thing. I, I think I had used a fairly earthy metaphor that I think actually got cut from, from the manuscript of Deeper Heaven, where I'd said that the that the religious leaders of the day had gotten into bed with the science, right? They were, and so now and then they were wedded to it, as as Pastor Wilson said. And so that is that was the conflict, not that oh, we believe that the Bible says that the earth is the center and we're going to dogmatically stick to that regardless of what anyone will say. They they weren't making that argument in the first place. They had, again, had adopted um, the Aristotelian ideas about what was out there, right? Um, about the uh, perfection, right? That everything under the moon was fallen and, and that's where decay was and everything outside of the moon is, is unfallen and pure and perfect. And, and when you get uh, then, you know, rudimentary telescopes starting to come into play and you're getting to see more and more of what's actually happening, um, out, out there, um, it was just, it was putting a big, big dent in the scientific, uh, thoughts that they already were clinging to. And that was the problem. So let's talk a little, uh, another thing to add, just a little historical detail here, is the Pope, when Galileo was doing his thing, the Pope was kind of sympathetic to Galileo, to Galileo and wanted to let him say his piece. And so the Pope said, Galileo, you can publish your views, but just do it in an equal time, just publish it in a dialogue where both sides are represented. You know, let's do it that way. So Galileo, Galileo did that, but the the um, advocate of the traditional view in his dialogue was named Simplicio. <laughs> in other words, he did this dialogue with one of the characters was named stupid. <laughs> and, and so the, the Pope, the Pope felt double crossed uh, rightly. And that was, a, that was part of the uh, tension of the time. Not a good start. No. So, so um, as much as I want to dig into every minute detail of it, but let's, I, I want to leave some room for readers to go on the journey. Let's, let's pick up the story when um, the spacecraft first enters space and, and, uh, and Ransom's experience of being, um, of being in the heavens. So let's, let's start there. Um, uh, maybe Doug, if you want to take that sort of what, what is he experiencing yeah. that that's sort of counter 
to what we think of as space? Yeah, uh, what we expect, anticipate about space is very much what Ransom, the, the protagonist, was anticipating. So he thought he was going to go up into outer space. And part of Lewis's intention with his project is to get us to stop thinking of space and start thinking of the heavens. That That's, uh, if you had to put his project in a nutshell, he wanted us to start thinking of the heavenlies again. And for modern Christians, heaven and the heavens are in the 17th dimension somewhere, tucked out of <laughs> yeah. tucked out of sight. But for the medieval, they could go out and look at heaven every night. You, just yeah. look up. You, you can you you're you're not in the party yet. You're outside the banqueting hall with your nose pressed against the window, and you're not in yet. But you can see it. And so uh, Lewis has this uh, marvelous passage where Ransom is having his whole world undone and he's coming to understand I'm up in the heavens. I'm not in this empty uh, vacuum called space. Mm -hmm. Christiana. Yeah, I think that is very clearly like pastor Wilson said, Lewis's whole project. He says it very clearly at the end of out of the silent planet in the postscript where he says something like, you know, if I have affected even a small percentage of my readers, the idea of the heavens rather than space, then I will have succeeded. He says it very clearly. And that chapter, I think it's chapter five of Out of the Silent Planet, where um, where Lou, uh, Ransom, the character, is in, in the spaceship and and he experiences the light, right? And, the, and this light isn't just, it's not just light. It actually imparts uh characteristics to him, right? He feels energized and alert and um, lucid, like he's never felt before in his entire life. And so this light is very personal. Um, it's not just, and, and that's the whole idea too, is that not only is space full, but it's alive and alive with not just um, impersonal organisms, but there is a personality to everything that's going on up there which is obviously directly connected to what we believe about the creator, that everything has personality because it was created by a personal God. And so I think that that is just a very key passage and it is the shift. Um, it kicks off the entire rest of the trilogy, that chapter there when that happens. Yeah. It's, it sort of makes the point that outer space, as we understand it, is not this cold, dead, lifeless emptiness it's actually, it's actually full of life and, and, and how right. central that is to the cosmology that he's putting forth. Go ahead. Including the, including what we would call the vacuum of space. Mm -hmm. It's filled with Eldil's uh, angelic beings. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and that was, that, that's the big mental shift to imagine that rather than going out into empty space, it, it is, it is the heavens and, and he communicates that feeling of it being heavenly in this really visceral way. Yes. And, and so, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I guess not. That was... <laughs> okay. So, um, so now, okay. So, uh, so we get to um, the silent planet, Malachandra, and, and I, I'm so curious about your, your thoughts about the Harasa. Um, and now there, now there, there are different species on, on planet. And I, I could speak quite a bit about each one, but the Harasa are the most, I think they're the ones that are painted in the most vivid colors. So maybe we could just talk about them for a second. Cause they're the first alien beings, I guess you'd say that he encounters through the whole trip. Yeah, I'll kick that one to you, Doug. Go ahead. Okay, so there are three different uh, types of sentient life on Malacandra or Mars. Uh, the Harasa are the first, um, like, uh, sentient, uh, poetic, large otters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, they're, they're <laughs> like that. Then there are the the Sorns, who are the philosophers and the astronomers, and then the Piffeltrigi, who are the miners and the craftsmen, and so on. So you've got three very different types of being, uh, all with their different body life gifts, and they get along with each other. They're at peace with each other, but very, very clearly different, all of them contributing uh, what they do. So 
They're the craftsmen, artisans with their hands, the piffle triggy, the poets, the makers of songs, the hunters, which would be the harasa, and then the uh, the beings with their head in the clouds would be the sorns. I never get tired of hearing you say piffle triggy. <laughs> yeah. So, Christian, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the nature of there being three unfallen races. Because once you made that point, that this is a picture of this of, of a planet without any members that are fallen, I was like, oh, I hadn't actually picked up on that. Yeah, so it it's interesting because this, uh, I think Malachandra is especially interesting because there are definitely uh, results of the fall. You can see effects of, um, in even the landscape of the fall on Malacandra. And obviously bad things happen there too, right? Um, you have the uh, Weston and, and divine instance when they, when they get involved and, and all that. But the interesting thing is, is I think Ransom's character and what happens to his, to his imagination and just his entire worldview, you could say, uh, as he, as he is on Mars and interacts with these creatures, because he has no category. His, his Im imagination has not been trained um, mm -hmm. to handle a category of creature that is not man and yet is sentient and rational and and has its own own way of thinking of things and has no conception of things like war or battle, which is kind of ironic considering that they are on the planet of Mars mm -hmm. after all. And but it's not hostile um, and they are not yeah. hostile to him. Exactly. Yeah. He has all these. Uh, imaginations going on, running through his head, these scenarios of um, aliens, right? Of what extraterrestrial, the word extraterrestrial means. And it's been entirely shaped by his imaginative training, by the stories he's been told and the things he's um, heard about here on earth. And he is in, fully anticipating something that is not man and therefore not humane or rational or kind right is, is if it's not man and it's it's sentient then it's going to be um ant antithetical to man it's going to be it's going to be hostile um and so he has to completely undo all of that uh, training that foundation has to be entirely broken up so that he can have room for this new category and in all of his interactions with the rasa and he he makes good friends with one in particular there's all sorts of conversations that occur that i think could not happen in another another setting with another character because of that very fact. And so it really opens, opens the door to many really, I think, fascinating and interesting conversations between, between him and these creatures uh, that just uh, are, are fascinating to, to read and give us insight into what Lewis thinks about um, a lot of different topics, especially with the Hrasa um, song and poetry and storytelling. And maybe we can talk also a little bit about how um, Venus and Mars portray different aspects of masculinity and femininity and, and how that shows up, particularly in Malacandra in these three different three different races. I don't know if Doug, if you want to if you want to have a crack at that. Well, um Malacandra is very masculine. He's the god of war. Um uh Paralandra, which is the next book, is uh the Oyarsa associated with Paralandra is venus obviously uh mars is the one the angelic being that oversees malacandra um paralandra if, if i you can per, permit me to run ahead is yeah, please. Vo voluptuous it's just very it's a uh sensory overload for um for ransom it's just gorgeous and luxuriant and paradisal and it's just and then malacandra is austere although the the three races live down in the clefts of deep valleys and the surface of mars is desolate the result of a great war earlier um but even even in the places that are habitable uh and are very nice um there's it's still austere it's um it's rugged I don't want to say wilderness. It's not like a wilderness, but it's austere is the way to uh, put it. And it's uh, it's got a masculine temper and a masculine feel um, throughout. And uh, and then Paralandra is very much uh, a feminine uh, place because there's a an 
Adam and Eve on Paralandra, but the Adam figure is missing. And Weston, the bad guy, is the serpent who comes to tempt um, uh, the Venetian Eve. Mm -hmm. And so all the dialogue between Weston, who's the serpent, and Ransom, who's God's representative, all the dialogue is with a woman and with the woman's perspective. And um, it's just very, uh, just very pronounced. Mm -hmm. I was thinking. I was noticing that um, on uh, on Malacander, you had those three races that you have the sort of the warrior poets and the rasa, and then you have the the sort of uh, tall philosophers, I guess, who live in live in the live in the mountains, the Sorns, and then you have the the craftsmen and the piffletrigi, and and how on the planet on on the planet Mars, the masculine planet, you have all these different reflections of masculinity broken apart and across these three different races. Yeah, and there, it's all vocational. It's it's vocational. And the female aspects of the the female Piffeltrigi and the female Harasa and the female Sorns are largely not in the picture. Um, in, I think you probably see more of them with Harasa than with the others. I think one of the Piffeltrigi make a joke about their females, um, but they're off stage. They're off stage, and the Sorns are very. Um, engaged in their masculine pursuits yeah maybe we want to skip a little a little bit ahead so we can make through to make it make sure to make it through all the books let's go to the the ending of the of the first book with the encounter with the oyarsa with all the with all the 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 peoples of malacandra gathered christian i wonder if you can say a little bit about what's kind of going on in that moment for um for ransom and also for weston and divine perhaps i think so the end of that scene at the end where they're they're on the island with the Oyarsa and you have all of these different uh, creatures from Malacandra, Weston and Divine, there's kind of this um, almost like a courtroom scene, right? They're trying to figure out what is going on and what to do with Weston and Divine. And I think one of, well, there's a lot going on in that mm-hmm. scene and a lot of things that we get a lot of insight into um, Weston and Divine and their purposes, their um the inner workings of their mind, right? Like, why are they there? What are they looking for? What are they trying to do? But I think what it does perhaps more importantly is sets up, sets the stage well for the next, the next book, specifically with Ransom, because um, the reason that he can, the next book even happens is basically because he ends up learning the language of old solar and ends up able, he's able to communicate with these inhabitants. And so in this scene, he ends up acting like an interpreter between the Oyarsa and Weston and Divine. And so, which is a foreshadowing of the bigger, the role he's going to be playing in the second book. And so it ends up being kind of a, just a happenstance, right? That he ended up being the one that they grabbed. And he also ended up being a philologist. So he was really yeah. interested in learning the language and picking it up. And that sets the stage for everything that happens in the next book, which I find really fascinating that that's, that's looking forward, looking ahead and setting, setting the stage for that. Is it true that Ransom was based on Tolkien? I think I had read that somewhere, or I don't know where I picked that up. I think at least in part, Mm -hmm. uh, because Tolkien was a philologist as was, as was Ransom. Yes. And uh, Ransom undervalues his own physical prowess um, but he learns war. He becomes a great warrior. And Tolkien was um, in school, unlike Lewis. Tolkien was a jock in, in school, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and which Lewis very much wasn't. Lewis, yeah. had, uh, uh, Lewis had thumbs that wouldn't bend, so he couldn't <laughs> handle a ball. Oh, wow. um, anyway, that was... <laughs> if only he had been able to handle a ball, how many books would we not have? <laughs> God for broken thumbs. Yeah. So uh, maybe we can, before we jump into Paralanda, uh, Doug, maybe you can say a little bit about Ransom's transformation over the course, a little bit more about Ransom's transformation over the course of the Out of the Silent Planet. Like who's, who does he begin as? And then who does he end up as that sets him up for the rest of the story? Yeah. He begins as a mild-mannered Don who is very much uh, an expert in his field. Very, He's on, on the top of his game in his field, but he's an academic. Um, and 
that's um and that's all he's very much like lewis and tolkien in that respect he's a, he's an academic by the end of the uh, ransom trilogy he is uh the pen dragon he is an arthurian demigod um <laughs> He he is really just, and not a demigod in the ancient pagan sense, but in the Lewisian um, sense of um, a uh, recipient of God's glory resting on him. Uh, so when Jane, the protagonist of the last book, meets him, she just meets him and her world is undone. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to talk about Jane. <laughs> For sure. So, uh, so let's get let's get to Paralandra, and um, that you you mentioned it earlier, Doug. I, I want to talk about the Unman and the Green and the Green Lady. It's sort of like the 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 narrative centers kind of around those two figures. Maybe Christian, you can begin talking about like who is the Unman, and then and who is the Green Lady, and then we'll we'll get into their interaction. Ransom's part in that little dance. Yeah. So the I mean the Unman starts out as Weston, right? Weston, um, he comes to Paralandra shortly after, not too long after Ransom arrives in Paralandra. And um, there's, so he he arrives there and it is very clearly Weston, but there's the series of conversations that he has with Ransom. And at one point, uh, it, things get very ramped up. Things get ramped <laughs> up, very heated. And he basically opens himself up to the possession by a devil. Um, a devil, possibly the devil, right? We don't exactly know for sure. Um, and he basically calls that power into himself and becomes very clearly not Weston anymore, right? Ran Ransom stops calling him Weston, even in his head at that point, and names him the Unman because it's something very clearly not human anymore. And that, and that is then the majority at, at that point, that's when he, the Unman, starts to try to tempt. Um, the Eve of that world, who is the green lady to disobey the command, you know, a very clear parallel to Genesis story. There's been, there's one command that has been given to her and to her husband, which is that they are not to spend a night on the fixed land. It's a, a Paralandra is a land of ocean, primarily ocean with floating islands. And then there is the fixed land, the land that does not float. And they have been commanded to not spend the night on the fixed land. And he, so he, the, throughout the rest of the most of the book, it's it's a lot of conversation in Paralander. Actually, most of it is just talking, really, until the last few chapters there. And so the Unman is then on a mission to try to convince the Green Lady to disobey that direct command. And Ransom is is doing his best. He feels very inadequate for the job to keep that from happening, stop that from happening. Doug, maybe, go ahead. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that interaction and sort of what's taking place, what what Lewis is trying to do there. I confess that my heart is still somewhere on Paralandra in the middle of that conversation. So I, I've been very excited yeah. about this. Oh, well, so is Ransom's. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so Ransom has to go back to Paralandra at the end. He, his wound won't heal in any other world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Paralandra is altogether uh, lovely. Um, so you have, um, this, uh, threefold conversation with the green lady and the unman and then ransom and ransom feels out of place the whole time. He feels outgunned. He feels outmaneuvered. He feels, uh, totally not adequate for the task that's been th thrust on him. And he, he feels like the cleverness of this demonic presence can anticipate him and outdo him at every turn. And so finally, uh, he, he's, he's thinking this cannot go on. Uh, the, the devil's going to wear, uh, the green lady out. You're going to wear her down eventually. And the thought occurs to him, well, maybe I should fight the unmanned physically. And which is, which he tries to, shove away because so obviously ludicrous but that's and he's he argues with himself are you saying that our world would have been spared uh sin and all this if an elephant had trodden on the serpent a moment before eve gave in um but it's very clear that god wants him to fight the unman 
And so, uh, ironically, Ransom learns war in Paralandra, not in Malacandra. Mm-hmm. You know? I remember that scene where where he he first engages with the fight, and I think he he expects it to be like he's fighting some sort of superhuman kind of being, and finds that it's it's ultimately still just a man. It doesn't yeah. make it necessarily any easier, but it, what it is, he describes he's expecting flying talons. Or something like that. It's a real vivid, um, it's a real vivid kind of image. And then, and then, as the story continues on, like, let's talk a little bit about um, about his relationship with God during during that, where God is actually like commanding him to fight, and that, and sort of that intuitive relationship that they kind of have. Maybe Christian, you can speak about that a little bit. Yeah, I think to be honest, that is one of my favorite scenes, and. Every, you know, a lot of questions, I always get the question, which is your favorite Rans- book of the Ransom Trilogy, which is a really hard question yeah. because, I mean, they're also, they're also different. And um, it, I, it's, the more I read them, the more I start to see them as a, as a whole, right? That each one just leads leads very well into the next. But I would ha- I always have to say Paralandra because uh, I do still remember the experience of reading it first. I think personally, it was very impactful. And that scene that you're talking about when when Ransom is just, he reaches that point of this, I must do this. I cannot do right. And he's wrestling with himself and he basically has to just come to that spot where he's like, well, this is, this is it, right. This is what I have to do. And um, that whole conversation too, about where his name comes into play. I love that scene because he, uh, he hears the voice telling him about, you know, Ransom. It's not for nothing that you are named Ransom. Mm -hmm. And he, that's the moment when he knows it's not just his own internal monologue that he's hearing. It's coming from outside of himself because he had never, you know, he's a philologist. He knows that his name does nothing to do with ransom, the word ransom. He even has this little note to himself, like, I know that it comes from Rand's son, you know, in the long ago and nothing to do with the word ransom. And so that's when it clicks for him. This is, this is someone else. This is something else from outside of me that is that is pushing me this direction and that i think and that gives him the confidence that he needs right the the will <laughs> the iron will to just do what needs to be done and that's that's a really important turning point for him becoming a a very martial figure on perlandra which is very important for setting him up again e- each thing lewis does with his character is setting up for the next setting him up for the next step the next movement forward which comes then to fruition in that hideous strength and the role that he plays there. So before we, we go on to that hideous strength, uh, there's a phrase in, I think it's in Paralandra that has stuck with me forever and it's time's corner. And I wonder, Doug, if you can talk a little bit about that, because I'm, I, that was, that was a whole thing when I read that, like, I just need to stop for a minute. Okay. Well, you're going to, um, I, I can hazard a wild guess because that sure. phrase didn't, didn't strike me. So I'll, I'll hazard okay. my wild guest and then hand it to Christiana. Um, you <laughs> okay. might be, you might be talking about the place where he has this, he has this recognition on Paralandra that ultimately freedom and necessity are the same thing. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a point that Lewis argues for elsewhere, but it's this realization where uh, Ransom recognizes that he's, in a myth, you know, this whole thing is a mythic creation story and he's in it. And the fact that it's myth doesn't keep it from being real. Uh, in fact, it's, it, it's an ultimate sort of reality. And so I'm guessing that mm-hmm. Times Corner might be at that place where freedom and necessity meet, but I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> Christiana, your turn. And then I'll, and then I'll, I'll oh, chip wow. in my bit. Yeah, that's, well, that's a very good answer. So I, and I don't know if I remember exactly where that phrase comes up, but I, I think there's this, this moment too, where he's uh, talking about get free, free will and predestination and how do those two things basically work together. And he has this moment where he's thinking about our world and our fall and realizing that if he fails, if he fails in Paralandra to do what he was sent to do, then that world will then need to be redeemed as well. Mm-hmm. And what, you know, what great and terrible thing will, will God do? You know, we had the incarnation and the crucifixion. 
and that, you know, what, what great and terrible thing will God do? He's not going to do the same thing twice that he doesn't do this, tell the same story twice and realizing and, and realizing that doesn't let him off the hook. Right. Um, and so like, so again, he still has a role to play and, and he has to do it whether or not that is whether or not he is meant to succeed. It doesn't, doesn't let him abdicate right from his responsibility. So I think it's a sim- kind of a similar perspective, similar things, just looking at it from, from the story perspective, right? Again, he's, he's a character in this, in this story and he's seeing his role and seeing, well, even if I don't do what I need to do, God will still intervene. God will still save this planet somehow. And that's almost more terrifying mm-hmm. <laughs> than, than what he has to do. Yeah, you both you both had um, have pieces of it, and and uh, I, I really like that actually. So what struck me about that was the idea that the crucifixion and the resurrection was so cosmically significant as it echoes beyond Earth to the other planets in in the cosmos. That it, it's acknowledged as an event so singular in its nature that it, it transcends it transcends essentially everything to the point. Well, like, that, yeah, yeah, and that's why on Malacandra. The sentient beings are odd, odd other animals, mm-hmm. but on Paralandra, they're human uh, because after the incarnation on Earth, that that's how it's got to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that the, it's it's like headline news all throughout the cosmos. Because uh, for me, this was striking because we live in a, a, an era where there's so much science fiction uh, that is. I don't know, it's essentially technological in nature. I think, I think, I, I think Lewis had a term for it. I don't remember what it is, but it's almost as if the crucifixion doesn't exist. Like you watch Star Wars or something like that, or the fifth element is coming to mind, whatever sci- favorite science fiction movie. It's like, oh, it's just this, it, it's discarded entirely. But the notion, and then we're also, you know, we see in the news, you know, alien, alien disclosure or whatever comes up every year. And it's like, well, is that going to be, what's the dialogue going to be there? Versus the 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 visuals that uh, that C.S. Lewis puts in, it's like no alien life knows about the crucifixion and the resurrection in his cosmos. Like they they heard about it, they got the news, and that was that, that was something that was so um, perspective altering for me to consider the that possibility that it, it really stuck with me. All right, cool. So let's <laughs> let's run to uh, let's go to yeah. uh, to uh, that that hideous strength then which um, I have to thank you both for because I enjoyed that Helios Strength, but like I said, it left my heart on Paralandra. It wasn't until I read uh, Deeper Heaven and I listened to your lecture, Doug, that I really got the gravity of that Helios Strength and I, and I, and I understood. So let's, let's start with like, what was C.S. Lewis trying to do in that Helios Strength that was different from what he was trying to do in the other, than what he was doing in the other two books? Um, well, the silent planet is our planet, uh, Fulcandra. So the Oyarsa associated with these different planets are unfallen except for ours. So the devil uh, is the fallen Oyarsa of our world in, in Lewis's construct. And it's uh, the devil has taken over our world. And um, out of you, you all like uh, Paralandra the most. I'm my favorite. I love Paralandra, but my favorite novel of all time is that hideous strength uh, because there's so many parts of it where yeah. Lewis is just simply prophetic. Yeah. He's talking about our world and he's talking about our world today in 2022. And he was writing about it in the 1940s. Yeah. And, and I keep, how could you know that? How could you yeah. anticipate that? How could, well, it's because he, it's not that he understood technology. It's that he understood people. Mm-hmm. He, he understood God, God's word and he understood how people worked. And, um, and so that hideous strength basically gives you the vision of enemy occupied territory and the faithful band a small faithful band of resistance fighters, the company at St. Anne's um, is uh, headed up by Ransom, who is not a martial figure in this book. He doesn't do any fighting. He's a, he's a director. They call him a director, but he's actually a king. So he's a wounded, he's a wounded king who has great authority, uh, but doesn't do any actual fighting. And, 
uh, the the conflict in the book is o- almost entirely spiritual. And when violent, actual violence breaks out, it's conducted by animals in the in the banquet at Belbury. And Christiana, maybe you can talk about the characters of um, of Mark and Jane Studdock a little bit. So the story kind of centers around them. Yeah, so I, I think the first the first word of that his strength is matrimony, and that's kind of the theme sets the theme for the rest of the book. I think I think it's uh, Pastor Pastor Wilson. I think you've said before it's almost like a book on marriage counseling, right? <laughs> in a, in, a, in a or maybe I've heard someone say that is that it's I really Mark and Jane are the central characters, which kind of might draw us back a bit at first, seeing as how the first two books were following ransom in particular, and then. In this book, the camera focus is primarily on uh, these other two characters. But the reason for that is I, I think both of them are supposed to embody the characters of the Oyarsa, the planets that Lewis, that Ransom has already visited, right? Mark, his very name, you know, makes you think of Mars. And then Jane is meant to be an embodiment of Venus. And they are both uh, abdicating from those roles and rejecting those roles in very different ways, in almost opposite ways. And Ransom, as a jovial figure, as Pastor Wilson always already referred to, he's a kingly, wounded king figure, which is very reminiscent of Jove. Uh, Jove is the figure that connects. That's one of the the primary things that Jove does, is he connects things. So he is a bridge. And Ransom, in this book, bridges ends, ends up bridging and connecting Mark and Jane, bringing them back together, but also sir, he also serves as a bridge between Deep Heaven and the Silent Planet, uh, be, uh, working with, again, the the Oyarses from those planets, and then you have the figure of Merlin that comes in. So that just complicates things. <laughs> um, but Mark and Jane throughout the book, you know, it's very fascinating because the whole thing flips back and forth between one to the one to the next, which I think is why some people might have struggled with it a little bit because it can be a little bit jarring at times to jump back and forth between those two characters but primarily uh mark his his problem is he's uh constantly trying to get in right he wants to fit in he wants to be part of the the cool kids club which lewis calls the inner circle right um he wants to be in the know right and his fear constantly is of being left out um outside of where you know that spot everyone wants to get into the the elite right and so he's constantly trying to fit in kind of uh, doing what's expected of him trying to climb the ladder and and constantly get inside whereas Jane is she just she just wants to be left alone really she wants to get out she wants to stand out and um so she has rejected kind of the the role that she's called to, which is to be um, a wife and a mother. She despises her husband. She does has rejected childbearing and she just wants to be left alone in her, in her attic, academic attic to write her thesis on John Donne that no one wants to read anymore. (laughs) So, uh, so she has her, her, um, both of them face a moment of, you could call it conversion, I think, where they have to reject their rebellion, right? Which means for Mark, he has to actually stand firm and rebel because he's been constantly laying down the whole time and just taking what's coming at him. And he has to stop and say, say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to take that step. And Jane has to learn submission and not just submission, but submission to her own husband, Mm -hmm. which is perhaps more difficult because she sees what Mark is like and that's that's hard for her to do. She at one point is completely ready to submit to ransom because of who ransom is, and he rejects that submission, saying, "No, that does not that doesn't belong to me. That belongs to your husband." And so that's that's her moment of when she fi- finally realizes that's where she has to put that put that submission. It's a big moment. I wonder if we if um, Doug, can we talk a little bit about how? It's taking this the, the that hideous strength before we move on to Belbury and St. Anne's, how Lewis is able to take the stories of, say, uh, Greek and Roman mythology, Roman mythology, Venus and Mars, right, and 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 Jove, and roll them into a, a kind of a Christian, a Christian framework. It seems it seems a bit odd that he would fuse these two things together with this big cosmology, but he actually makes it work quite quite well. So uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that yeah. for a second. Yeah, I, th- I think the reason Lewis is able to do that is that he understands 
that he's just simply standing in a long tradition, a long Christian tradition, where Christian theological concepts were communicated routinely throughout the Middle Ages by means of classical tropes and classical gods and goddesses by Christians who didn't believe in the classical gods and goddesses. So um, Lewis is a specialist in medieval and Renaissance literature. He just, I think he probably read everything that, <laughs> that had ever been written in that era. And he was just simply steeped in it. I think he's simply uh, continuing the the tradition. So it's not a, a C.S. Lewis novelty where he comes along and tries to communicate Christian uh, doctrine by means of uh, these deities. What he does is um, he he understands that, as the Apostle Paul says in Corinthians, there are God's many and there are Lord's many. But for us, there's just one God. So for the ancient Greeks, the gods and goddesses were gods and goddesses. For the Christians, it's not the gods and goddesses were nullities or superstitions, but rather fallen celestial angelic beings that had reality that could actually do things. So when in Acts 16, when the apostle Paul cast the demon out of the fortune-telling girl, um, it says literally in the Greek that he cast out the spirit of a python. Um, and, and you think, really, really? <laughs> well, what that tells you is that what, uh, what that tells you is she was a devotee of the god Apollo because oh. the oracle at Delphi was called the Pythoness because the story was that Apollo had come down to Delphi and had slain a giant python there. And so this girl who had the spirit of a python is a devotee of Apollo. That, that's what it's saying. Now, she really could tell fortunes, and Paul really did bankrupt their business. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't, it wasn't superstition. It's just that the pagans would call them gods, and the Jews, and then later the Christians, would call them demons. Um, so then later in medieval Christianity, uh, the spiritual reality of these gods and goddesses was taken for granted but they were put into a cosmos where the creator God was over all. And, and Lewis treats them as angelic beings. Not as demonic beings. Right. Well, the unfall, there's demonic beings down yeah. here on the silent planet and angelic ones, unfallen ones in the heavens. Got it. As the we are so of the, of the various planets. Right. So, it, and they have, they, sorry, they they have their their fallen counterparts on Earth. So we see that in that he has strength when Jane gets a glimpse of what Lewis calls the infernal Venus. So a, a glimpse of the terrestrial um, embodiment of that that goddess, right? Venus, what we would who we would call Venus, but she's just a terrestrial version of a fallen version of the Oyarsa of Venus, right? Which would be the angelic being, which we see come down in, um, in the chapter, the descent of the gods, when all of the, all of the Oyarsa come down to St. Anne's and, um, give power to Merlin, right? Fill Merlin with their, their spirit basically. And so that's, that's kind of where I think where Lewis is making a distinction between the, the fallen terrestrial version that we would see in like the, in the Greek myths and, and things like that versus the, right. the, um, the Oyarsa, Oyarsa, the outside of the moon's boundary version. That's very helpful actually. Cause I, I was, I was struggling with that distinction. Like what makes, what makes them, uh, you know, demons in one context or angelic beings in another one. And this one, it seems like they're angelic. So that's actually helpful for me. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. so the gods uh, have, the gods have doppelgangers. <laughs> right. Uh, as much as as much as I want to talk about the lunar boundary, I want I want to talk about the, the prophetic aspects of the book, which are which are embodied in Belbury, because 40 no well, coming up on what 60 years ago, no, 80 years ago, C.S. Lewis called so many things that we're seeing right now. And Doug, I wonder if you could talk about those because that's when you guys pointed that out in Deeper Heaven, or Christian, you pointed that out in Deeper Heaven. It's like when it clicked for me, like. No, he called this stuff a long time ago. And Doug, you, you mentioned yeah. it. Yeah. So there are multiple examples of it. But one is when Philostrato, one of the bad guys, is pointing to the moon. 
having been scrubbed of all organic life. Um, and he, what Lewis communicates effectively is the bad guys are really fastidious. They're very spiritual. They don't like biological life. They don't like uh, de- uh, they don't like uh, dirt. <laughs> mm-hmm. they, they they don't like fallen leaves. They they don't like any of those things. And they want to scrub the planet clean, right? Um, to make it look like the moon, and then have the the slightest, most tenuous connection to biological life possible. And so Lewis predicts sex with robots. He predicts um, certain develop developments with uh, uh, reproductive technologies. He um, predicts, I think, the the current climate change cult, um, mm-hmm. where where you have this understanding that one of the primary pollutants of according to our masters is what we breathe out right so here here you are going around breathing all day the the, the co2 is uh, a pollutant and instead of us breathing and breathing out what is the lifeblood of trees and bushes uh, so Lewis is pointing at this fastidious aversion phobia of um, true biological human existence, and he, and also the um, the head the head of uh, of Belbury. There's something there's something demonic about it as well, right? Yeah. Sort of maybe he's calling maybe he's calling it uh, maybe artificial intelligence, right? Which we're seeing a little bit of. Yeah, today. and he's detached from a body. So uh, he's hooked up to machines. They keep him alive artificially, and they would dispense with the head as soon as they could figure out how to do that. They they, they want to be pure spirit. And then um, contrast that with what's going on at uh, at Saint Anne's, like like the the way that Lewis draws the contrast between the yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. So that you've got a vegetable garden, and you've got animals running all over the place, and you've got a bear in the house. Um, the comp- uh, a jacked on the house and ransom has made friends with the mice and you've you've got this um teeming menagerie of biological life which is sort of a reflection of malacandra all these different kinds of creatures getting along and it's it's a very strong contrast to what is going on at belbury where they're conducting vivisection experiments and they've got all the animals in cages and are mistreating and abusing them. Um, Lewis uh, puts those two things side by side. And Christian, can you say a little bit about how they reflect maybe the different personalities of, of Mark and Jane and some of the journeys that they're on? Uh, specifically, so St. Saint, Saint Anne's and Belbury. Yeah, what they you know, reflect some, about the, yeah. Yeah, so Mark, you know, Mark gets sucked into the NICE and Belbury and all of that. and. And he, you know, he he's kind of put himself there by his attempts to keep working his way up the ladder, keep getting in, you know, being drawn further in and further in. And by the time he realizes that this maybe isn't a good idea, this maybe isn't where he wants to be, it's really too late. And he's he can't he can't escape. He tries actually escaping at one point and and is brought back and doesn't isn't able to to get away. And so he's. Uh, just becoming more and more entrapped in that, and and he realizes um, when they 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 take it too far. Actually, they push him to the breaking point when they put him in this uh, in this room, and they're trying to basically kind of uh, brainwash him <laughs> in a way. And he, but he keeps he reaches a point where he just he can't keep going any further, and he has his his conversion moment. And uh, interestingly, thoughts thoughts of Jane. And not just Jane, but all of the things that Belbury is trying to destroy, the things that Pastor Wilson was talking about, just simple pleasures, right? Very, very homey, very physical. You know, he, I think he talks about the smell of, of so, the soap that Jane uses and, and just all these just very homey domestic things. All of those thoughts are what keep help him keep his sanity uh, because it's it's the real it's what's real right it's the reality um and and what they're they're trying to strip from him and drive away from him and then then on the con on the other side you have jane at saint anne's which is that the world that 
um, we just described full of animals and all these different people. And Jane doesn't really want to be a part of all that at first, right? She's dragged in kind of kicking and screaming the whole way. Um, but she gets gets looped in um, to, to doing that and helping them because she's she has her um, dreams, right? She has prophetic dreams and, and sees uh, sees things. And so not only is she there to help them, but also to protect her because the NICE wants to get their hands on her as well. And so she's looped in against her will where, where Mark just went, you know, full steam ahead, wanted to try to get in. Jane is drawn in, um, not, not willingly at first, but then uh, she finds her place in this kind of motley, motley crew uh, at St. Anne's as well. And her, again, she's, she's having to learn, as we said earlier, how to, how to submit in the proper proper way to the proper person to mark especially and even when he is not one perhaps that is worthy of her submitting to mm. she's still called to that regardless of his his uh, ability to be someone that she desires to submit to. still you know that's that's something she has to struggle with is that that's still what she is she's called to do uh, Pastor Doug, I know you have to go in, in just a minute, but I wonder if you could say a, a few words about uh, The Room of Ob Objectivity. And I heard you say that it was your favorite novel of all time. And so uh, yes. I'd like you to make a, a pitch for all the listeners to, to go and pick up a copy of, of, uh, the, Sp of the Ransom Trilogy, not the Space Trilogy, and, and Deeper Heaven. So go ahead and make that pitch for them uh, after we speak yeah. about The Room, room of Ob Objectivity. Okay, so um, if you, when you first get the, that hideous strength, it's... You, it's a thriller or that's, uh, but it doesn't seem like a thriller when you, when you first start reading the first few chapters are just sort of chugging along and you think, what, what is this? But by the, but when the action starts, it turns into this white knuckle roller coaster ride. Um, it's, it's just a, I think a magnificently plotted and crafted novel on the, on that level. It is a prescient, uh prophetic novel um i feel like i know the characters all of them from ivy mags the help to mr bultitude the bear to uh to mcphee the crotchety uh unbelieving friend of ransom i i know them and uh it's just so well done and then i'll i we've mentioned merlin a couple of times mm -hmm. um the Merlin gets hauled in. There's no trace of anything like that in out of the silent planet or out of, uh, or, or Paralandra. And what happened was during the writing of that hideous strength, Lewis met Charles Williams. The war was going on. Charles Williams works, worked for Oxford university press. He came from London. He came out to Oxford because of the bombing. Um, and Lewis met his acquaintance and, Charles Williams was an Arthurian fanatic and made an immediate conquest of Lewis. Tolkien didn't really like all the Arthurian stuff because for Tolkien, Arth King Arthur was just like yesterday's newspaper. It was just, it was too recent. It was too modern. He wanted <laughs> things in the midst of antiquity. Um, but uh, Williams had this, pronounced effect on Lewis bringing Merlin in and that whole Arthurian world, which I think is a triumph and a real success. I I, agree. I, I just think it's uh, well done. I agree. I agree. Well, that was one of the striking things I, I when I read later that people didn't like that aspect of the book. I was like, I thought it was, I thought it was perfect. I thought it was the perfect way to, to tie yeah. everything together. It's and one surprise, of, go ahead. It's one of the most fun things ever <laughs> when Merlin shows up at their house and they start to trying to get along. It's just fun. Is the only way to describe it. <laughs> yeah, that three that scene with the three riddles is um, that stuck with me for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for thanks for joining us, Pastor Doug. I really appreciate it. Christian and I are yeah. going to keep talking for a bit, um, but again, I appreciate right. your time and, and and your wisdom about all this. Well, thank you, and uh, again, congratulations to Christiana for her marvelous book. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Cool. So, um, so great. So, um, I, um, thank you for being willing to continue the conversation because uh, obviously yeah. there's so much, so much more to cover. So, um, uh, let's, I, I want to take a, like a step sideways, maybe let's call it. 
and, and say, like, how did working on Deeper Heaven change you? Because I can imagine like having the opportunity to dig in to a work like the Ransom Trilogy, all three different books, and especially the way that you exhaustively explored all of the literary references and one of the appendices. What was that process like for you? Did you say you started writing it in 2014? So it's like, what, a seven-year project? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I would say, so 2014, 15 was when I, I wrote my undergraduate thesis, which was a 14,000 word thesis. It was, and it was a little more argumentative where I was making um, references or drawing parallels between the Ransom Trilogy and Dante's Divine Comedy um, specifically. So, so a lot of work with Dante. And so a lot of that ended up in deeper heaven, but there, there was some that didn't end up making the cut because again, I was, I was trying to make a specific uh, point about what Lewis was doing. So I, I really started in earnest, probably you know, 2015. So about, about five years. And that's not, that's not constantly, there were some lulls, lulls. I, I wrote the majority of it actually in one year, which was <laughs> kind wow. of insane one uh, school year, actually. Wow. So it was a lot, you know, I will say a lot of reading a lot of reading. Lot of reading. Um, <laughs> and it really was, and I mean, it was an amazing opportunity and amazing experience. The The most impactful things I think were digging into a lot of that primary literature that you mentioned that, that Lewis himself would have read and would have been steeped in because that is something that we can't, you know, can't take for granted. You know, he is, he is a product of the vast amounts of literature that he just, you know, was marinating, marinating in his entire life. And all of that shaped his mind and shaped his writing. And so being able to dig into that and, and track these threads, especially like you mentioned that, that appendix that I did where I just, I tried to trace all the allusions or quotations that he included. And, you know, he wasn't so kind as to include footnotes. <laughs> so right. a lot of that just meant, you know, meant digging in and, and, some of it is is very obscure and some of it is you know can can drive you a little nuts because i'm sure lewis is chuckling to himself about this but he would throw in things that he just made up so he'd have a list of authors or or various people and some of them would be true and real historical people and then others he would have just made up out of his own head how do you find that you, you know you can't figure how do you figure that out and so you, you just don't do a lot of digging and digging yeah. and and eventually you say, you know, I think he made this up. That's my best guess. Or, you know, he he wrote in that his strength um, in Bragdon Wood, there's a well with an inscription in Old English, and he attributes it to this um, old Germanic monk and who really existed, but did not write the lines of poetry that Lewis attributes to him. Lewis, Lewis himself wrote those lines of poetry and just attributed them to them, to this, to this Germanic monk. So, you know, things like that, you're just like, wow, this, this, this is a lot, but that experience is just, I mean, obviously it helped me, I think, draw more connections myself because it's giving, it's giving me a, a broader knowledge base. I mean, I learned so much from writing this project and that I can now draw from, you know, so that personally has just given me a lot more knowledge and insight into Lewis and his writings. And I constantly learn more and see more every time I reread them, but being able to, to draw more connections and see how everything is so, so interwoven, right? We live in a, in a cohesive world, a world that's held together by uh, the word of God. And, and so we can draw those connections all over the place. And I, so I think that that, that is a, was a blessing and um, hugely hugely rewarding to me to work on this project. Mm. And uh, what I appreciated about, about the book was that it wasn't a substitute for reading the trilogy itself. Like there was plenty of space for the trilogy to move around and, and to accentuate my experience of, of reading the books, not to replace it. And that, that felt deeply honoring to me of what C.S. Lewis had created. Yes, I definitely want yeah, I want it to drive people back to the trilogy constantly. So um, hopefully, you know, if someone reads the books and then wants some insight into it and they read it, hopefully my goal would be you read the books, you read it, and, and then it makes you want to read them again <laughs> and again and again and keep seeing, you know, keep seeing new things because I know there's there's always new things. I always have to remind myself that 
the subtitle of my book is not a comprehensive reader guide because I, mm-hmm. I, 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 my temptation is to want to, you know, oh, we need to do a second edition because I, I made this discovery. It's like, no, we're just gonna leave it. I, you know, there will be a place for that discovery. Someone else will notice it. Um, this is to, to guide you through it, kick you, kick you off on your journey. And hopefully you'll read it many, many times. Okay. Now I know, I know I want to know what the discovery is. Well, I did realize, so, well, one thing I realized was I let, you know, I found another allusion for the, for the index, you know, a, an allusion to uh, Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov in one of, in the, and I think it's that hideous strength. Um, I'm gonna have to look it up now and see where it is, but there's a reference to a story and the story is from Dostoevsky. So there you go. Oh, is it, is it the Grand that, Inquisitor that is, maybe? Is it that? Um, perhaps. Yeah. Or there's something about an onion, a story oh. with an onion oh. uh, reference. <laughs> okay. There's yeah. always more to find, always more to find. Well, it, that's the thing is, is that that appendix in particular, uh, it, it caught me by surprise, right? So not only had, had you highlighted so many different themes through the book that I didn't pick up on, through the books that I didn't pick up on, for example, like when I was reading Out of the Silent Planet. But I, I had no idea what to expect. My, my best friend, Eddie, was like, well, you have to read these books. You have to read these books. And so I gave myself a, a little staycation this past summer. I was like, I'm, okay, I'm looking for something to read that sort of like summertime vaca- vacation reading, you know, so I'll read, I'll, I'll read the space trilogy. Why not? And as I'm working my way through Out of the Planet, I'm like, what is, what's happening? Right. And, it, you know, it takes, a, it takes about a book or so to get into it. And then, you know, by the end of Paralandra, it's like, I'm just going to stay here for a while. And then that hideous strength. And then digesting the whole thing, it was so much. And so then when I discovered your book, it brought everything back up. It helped me put all the pieces together in this way that I could see the books as a cohesive whole. And I want to talk about the cover as well. And then when I read the index, it was like it was like I could see all the ways that C.S. Lewis had sprinkled his genius right through the book. And so it, yeah. it, it, it I don't know how to say, it didn't transform my experience of reading the books, it, it did something special that it solidified it. I don't really know. And, yeah. and that's why I was curious about the process of writing it because maybe it did something similar for you. It did. Yes. I mean, I, my copy of the Ransom Trilogy is pretty much an annotated version now because I, yeah. I am a fan of writing in books. I know some people might be horrified by that, but sure. I write in my books. Uh, so I, I mean, they're dog-eared, they're falling apart, they're marked up. I keep reading them. And every time I read them, you know, I, I gained something new from them and I, so yeah, re- reading, reading them with a researcher's eye, it, that came about, it was almost hard. Sometimes I remember there being times when I'm like, okay, I'm going to to look for a certain thing. Cause I'm working on this chapter and I'm looking at trying to pick out these themes. So I'm going to go pick up this book and read. And I would just get sucked in and start reading. And I, and then in 10 minutes passed, I'm like, Oh, I just read a whole chapter because I got sucked into the story. What was I looking for again? So, so part of it was, you know, just being focused on on the research process. But I, I think also one thing that was really helpful is reading C.S. Lewis's letters um, on, especially looking through the index of his letters to every look at every time he talked about ransom and the ransom trilogy and the planets because seeing seeing what he had to say himself about what he was trying to accomplish and what and in some instances what he was not trying to accomplish was really helpful for solidifying some of the things that I was trying to communicate and and helping me to make them clearer and also be able to be a little more forceful with what I was saying you know so cuz I might have an opinion about what he was trying to do but but if I can see, oh, he said in a letter, this is what he was trying to do. I can I can bring that in and actually communicate that more clearly, and and hopefully have a little more weight behind um, what I'm what I'm trying to say. Excellent, excellent. Mission accomplished. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. So let's let's jump back into that hideous strength and talk about. And this was the, this was one of the biggest thematic things that I took away from from deeper heaven was I, I didn't see so clearly the dynamic between uh, Mark and Jane, Venus and Mars. And I mean, I understood obviously their reconciliation, but I didn't understand the deeper thematic elements of it. So let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah, I think, um, so obviously seeing how Lewis really puts the focus on them is the first question that I had. It's like, okay, why, 
why did we move away from Ransom? I mean, he's still a central character, but he's not, we're not seeing things from his perspective anymore. We're not in his head. It's a totally different feel from the first two we're with Mark and Jane. There has to be, at the very just narrative level, there has to be a reason for that. Why, why are we with Mark and Jane now? And then that first word of the of the book is matrimony. So the focus of marriage and why why is marriage so important in that book? And why is getting Mark and Jane to be who they are supposed to be so important, right? That is almost, that's the driving, driving factor. Um, a lot of Ransom's conversations with Jane are about her relationship with Mark. You think, isn't there more thing, important things to be talking about right now? You know, the, the NICE is trying to take over and destroy everything. And we're talking about one couple and their marriage, right? And, and so that really is the driving, you know, gives a, an idea of how, how important Lewis saw this. And I think it also gives insight into the NIC. Like, what, what are they trying to do with humanity? They're trying to erase humanity, really, and remove our the physical element, remove who we are as human beings, remove male and female entirely as, as even concepts, which we see, obviously, I think Lewis was being very, again, very prophetic in that because we see that constantly now in our culture, right? That we don't even know what a man and what a woman is anymore. And we're trying to completely erase um, any and all distinction. And so that is actually at the heart of what Belbury and the NICE is trying to do. And so that is why it is so important that Mark and Jane kind of standing in as figureheads, if you will, for masculinity and femininity in the form of Mars and Venus, um, that their reconciliation is so important and they're um, embracing their God-given role and their God-given calling as man and woman, as husband and wife, is central to St. Anne's success against the NICE, right? So the, we're st- we have a, a mini picture of the cosmos in St. Anne's, right? In St. Anne's, you have men and women and animals and all existing in a mini picture of the world, right? And then you have Belbury, which is trying to destroy all of that. They're trying to destroy organic life, destroy animals, um, destroy man and woman, destroy the image of God in creation. And so you have, you know, you have to stand that. That's why it's so central to uh, the theme of that book, I think. And you mentioned the submit the submission that Jane has to learn. You know, it's pretty clear. Mm-hmm. I mean, Mark has his own challenge. We'll talk about, you know, how he's kind of the embodiment of the men without chests, right? Like that's his that's his whole thing and not necessarily a worthy man. And yet Jane still has to go through, she still has to go through that journey. This is the man, this is the man that she chose, and and that's that's kind of how it is. So let, let, let's talk about that. That because that's I know that's up for a lot of people right now. That comes up in my you know, yes. my podcast and in my community quite a bit. Yes. So I think what's fascinating the way Lewis presents it too is that Jane she actually doesn't have a necessary problem with submission because as a concept because she ha- finds herself well, almost against her will, being willing to submit to Ransom. And there's a very, very important um, scene. She's so struck by him, which with not without reason, not without cause, because he is is a very striking figure, right? He's come back from Paralandra. We see the way it describes him. Lewis just pulls out all the stops on the kingly imagery in how they describe him. You know, he has, he has blonde golden hair. He's young again, right? He's uh, he's just amazing, right? He's awe-inspiring, and you know, a picture of of masculinity and strength and wisdom and just everything, everything. And Jane is overcome by that, right? She she's very impressed by that, and so it shows like she has a sense of as a woman that the need that kind of design feature of submitting to a godly masculine man is kind of built into her DNA, but there's a big problem, which is that she's not married to that man. So she's not supposed to see him. That's something that she is supposed to do only with her husband. And Ransom calls her out on that. And he actually calls her out. There's a really um, striking scene where he calls her out on never trying to submit, that she never even gave it, gave it, you know, she didn't try to obey and that obedience, um, is a discipline, the idea of it being a dis- discipline and not just an emotion, right? And that emotion, 
discipline can actually shape our love, right? Obedience can shape our love um, versus, you know, we only have to feel the love first before we can obey and submit, right? And so he he talks about that concept and that she she owes her submission to a certain person. And he so he cannot accept it. She is not allowed. It's not right or fitting for her to submit to ransom. And so that's that's a whole, you know, she has to wrap her mind around that concept and around the idea again that she's she's married us to a certain man and he has disappointed her and that but that is no excuse for her her not doing her not obeying and that that obedience actually has vastly important repercussions right that that this is you know there there have been things that have been put out of place because of her lack of obedience merlin i think says something there's a um, there's a prophecy about her child and that she that she's she's supposed to have this child and they had decided you know she didn't want kids so she made the decision consciously to not um not have children and that has completely ruined you know merlin says something about you know thousands of years of preparation for this mm-hmm. child and this woman has completely in her disobedience and stubbornness um, undone all of that now by the end of the book things are put right things are put back on back on track um but that's still something has been has been lost and missed because of um what she what she did not was not willing to do got it i'm glad you mentioned that because when i read that 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 scene that you're describing at that moment i was like i wasn't sure if that was describing an abortion or not like it seemed mm-hmm. almost to apply imply it but then i but then i read yeah, it I, I don't think it does i mean i think you could read it you could possibly read it in that way. I think it was more just, you know, it's the sort of we're gonna wait, we're gonna wait to mm-hmm. hold to have kids. You know, he was Mark was pursuing his career, she wanted to pursue her okay. career still, and so it's this sort of we're just we're not we're not doing that yet. So he's not very explicit in in that. That that is that is how I read it. I think there's various places where that kind of that interpretation. Um, I think a case could be made for that interpretation. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was like, that was a little shocking. That was a little shocking to me because Merlin reacts pretty strongly to that possibility. Like all is lost almost. Mm -hmm. It's like, Oh wow, this is really bad. But when I read deeper heaven, it's like, Oh, there's, there's deeper heaven. There's, there's hope at the end. Right. So it's not, not all is lost. Cause it's like, Oh, why don't just close the book right now? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So let's talk a little bit. We, we, we started out the conversation talking about the cosmology. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, about the cover um, which is yes. a gorgeous covers gorgeous by the way so describe- well, thank you yeah oh, go ahead sorry oh i was just going to say that so the cover yeah is, is by josiah nance who does uh he does a lot of design work for the publisher um roman rhodes who, who published my book and he also does freelance work really excellent i mean he's clearly very talented excellent he so he came up with I actually have my copy here mm-hmm. he came up with some, a variety of covers when we were discussing cover art and uh this one stuck out for a number of reasons which was kind of funny because he actually didn't think this one was the one that would be chosen Hmm. um but there's there's a couple reasons one thing i like from far away um it almost looks spherical there's Hmm. almost like it kind of starts to get a three-dimensional because of the rings and the color variation almost a three-dimensional so the whole thing almost looks like a sphere, which makes sense um, because of the the cosmology, the planets. Uh, But then we do have the seven rings uh, of the seven, the seven planets um, here. Now it is sun centric too. The the center is actually meant to be meant to be the sun. So, so it is in order of our solar system, planetary system, which again is kind of meshing uh, what Lewis does in, in the ransom trilogy, which is mesh the the physical framework of our solar system post Copernican revolution and infusing it with the the ideas and the spiritual realities that made the medieval cosmology come alive and so potent to him um, so I think I, I really love how that is reflected in the cover I think um, he he did a great job of picturing that and then um, I haven't I haven't asked him but I think he did choose the colors. And the colors kind of in a, a way to reflect the the planetary figures also moving out from the, from the sun, obviously being the gold kind of gold at the center. Mm, yeah, when I looked at this, it, it helped me understand that cosmological vision that I think is is so essential. 
the idea that, you know, the earth really is like, it's the drain, it's the drain for the cosmos. Yeah. Like when we say, you know, to, to imagine that the way that a medieval person would have seen things, it's not any privileged position for us to be here. And in fact, thematically, the notion that we are just that close to the drain of the entire cosmos, certainly the solar system, and that Christ would, would come down and die for this this race, this nowheresville race, mm. you know, yeah. it, it's it, it's all the more striking. Let's talk. Uh, I'd love to talk about that a little bit more because I yeah. took that from your book. Yeah, and I think, and that is what Lewis saw as the tension in the medieval cosmology when when you had a crit when the Christian uh, uh, perspective, Christian worldview. So he saw, and he mentions this in Discarded Image that there's one discordant element in an otherwise entirely harmonious cosmology. And that is the incarnation, right? How do we reconcile man's worthlessness in the cosmos, right? Just the dregs of the universe, the very bottom with man's importance in being created in the image of God and in the incarnation, you know, we're, we're joined with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. We're raised with him to new life. And now, you know, God became man, Christ incarnate. And he, he now has taken on our flesh, right? How does that, how do those two things join? Lewis saw those two things as kind of bumping heads, right? Um, our worthlessness on the one hand, and yet this central kind of this, this importance, right? Mankind kind has, a dignity. It's kind of like that line from, I think, Prince Caspian that Aslan says to, to Prince Caspian when he says, you know, you are a son of, son of Adam. And that is both, oh, so I'm going to butcher the line now. It's like honor enough to lift the head of the most worthless be beggar and shame enough to bow the head of the most glorious king, right? Wow. It's like, it's that juxtaposition, right? Is that we are, we are fallen sinful man, but we're still created in the image of God. And then now also post-incarnation, there is this added glory that that God became man, right? The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so it's that it's that tension that I think Lewis really does an, a good job, an excellent job of seeking to resolve in the Ransom Trilogy because he's really wedding incarnational theology through the entire medieval cosmos and working that out, as we mentioned earlier with even, you know, the the distant lands, right? Mars and Venus, like people there have heard of, of what has happened, right? Um, when, when the green lady hears about the incarnation, I mean, she just can't even fathom it, right? Mm -hmm. It's just beyond their ability to imagine that, that uh, God came down to our tiny little insignificant planet, right? The, the, the silent planet. And so I think that that is something that Lewis is actively trying to harmonize right because he saw that he did say that he saw that as a discordant element in that that cosmology that he loved so so well and i think he does a really good job of wedding those two things together and kind of resolving that dis that that discord and making it making it sing more harmoniously and that's one of the reasons why the, the trilogy has has sat with me is this idea that the earth is nowheresville like, and god could have easily written off this entire planet like okay well i got infinity more you know but, but that god cared so much about us sinful fallen rebellious creatures in this cosmos teeming with life right which is the which is the heavens right it's not empty lifeless space it's full of life god loved <laughs> us so much send his only begotten son you know to suffer and die for our sins as a rebellious rebellious planet like the and 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 I think you highlighted it in um oh you that yeah because in at the end of the silent uh, out of the silent planet the oyarsa says it's something we desire to look into right and like that even yes. the angels are like we don't we don't get it like we just like yeah. how mind blowing is that yeah directly yeah echoing echoing first peter there but yeah so it, it's it's fascinating to me how lewis i mean he does not shy away from in being very clear, you know, that even just using direct quotes from scripture, you know, very clear what he is doing and that we have, you know, he, he gives different names like Mal El Deal is, is God. And then you have Mal El Deal the Young, which is Christ. And, and he mentions, you know, it's all he's saying is it's very clear and obvious. And yet it is funny how, how many people can miss it, right? Miss, 
the gospel so clearly present um, in these books. I, you know, I've, I've, I have heard people talk about the Ransom Trilogy before um, unbelievers who just don't even see mm-hmm. that it's, it's, it's Christ, it's God, it's the, it's the gospel. And same thing with the Narnia stories, right? That um, there's, there's so much there and yet it's, yeah, it's easy to, uh, apparently can be easy to miss it, but he does it so, so well um, and, and tells such good, good stories. Um, it's, yeah, it's obviously still being very impactful today. And especially I think the Ransom Trilogy being so prophetic in so many ways is, um, I think, I think it's seeing, especially in the last couple of years, seeing a resurgence and in, in popularity and more being more talked about. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, are we hearing more about it because there's, you know, been more books written about it or are more books were being written about it because it's just more important <laughs> now. Right. And we can see how a lot of these things, especially that his strength, a lot of these things are coming to bear uh, in, in our, in our culture, in our day. So yeah, it's, it's really good to see how, how it's getting more attention. I mean, I think it's, I, I mean, I agree. And, and I, I think the reason why, and I, at the start of every show, I do a little monologue intro, which enables me to kind of get straight into the interview instead of having everyone introduce themselves. But in, in, in this monologue intro, I'm going to talk about, and this is why I was so excited to have you both on, because obviously we're engaged in this um, cultural war, right? We're in a religious war of ideologies. We're in an institutional war. There's a, there's a war building around different behaviors and, and choices. Like, do we live in alignment with God's law? That's a whole thing. But what's left out of that discussion is this, cos- this cosmological battle, like to, a way to even understand the cosmos because our imaginations have been so saturated with this technological science fiction view of reality that says space is cold and dead and lifeless and we're just these nowhere, nothing creatures on a nothing planet in Nowheresville in this obscure arm of a galaxy. And, and we, we lack even the imagination to consider that the cosmos could be completely different. And that was the power of, of those books and also of your book in, in helping me put those pieces together. So now I almost walk around with a different understanding of reality, <laughs> right? It's transformative. Yeah. Yeah, we we get our we far more get our vision of the world and how we see see things from Hollywood than yes. we do the Bible, right? Um, and we think you know we get we go to our Bible to know you know how how should we think about God and and loving our neighbor and and that sort of thing. But then when it comes to things like you know the heavens declare the glory of God or that a star came down to Bethlehem and showed the wise men where where Jesus was. And we think, we just kind of think, oh, it was just a, you know, an angel or or whatever. But it mm-hmm. says a star, you know, the star came down. And you know, how does but the world is far more than than what we see in the movies, right? And yeah. especially like you mentioned technological like science fiction and you know things like things like Star Wars or Star Trek, especially Star Trek yeah. is very, it's a very modern um, idea because you know you have even have ships right all the planets are like islands in the dead sea right there's this vast spaces this vast dead sea and then you have these pockets of life which are all the planets and you have st- ships right starships that go from one to the other um same similar thing with um you know with star wars though star wars is a whole nother kettle yeah. of fish when it comes to the philosophical yeah, uh, underpinnings yeah. really right point the, more like manichaeism going on over there but um but so so but we do tend to just see just see it as oh it's just one more kind of just empty space to get through and to find to find new things and again we we tend to let let hollywood dictate how we're going to think about those things and when we look you know so i think i say this in the book but when you look out at the night sky and picture you picture the most amazing starry sky that you've ever seen you know no light pollution or whatever what does it make you feel? Do you feel like you're looking out at just vast emptiness with pinbricks of light and it just goes on and on and you feel you feel tiny and insignificant insignificant, but almost frightened, right? Terrified, like terrifyingly so that there's this yeah. vast abyss above your head. Or do you look up and say, wow, that's a great party up there? <laughs> you know, mm. look at all that. Look at that. And yes, we're not up there yet. We're not out there. But like Pastor, I think Pastor Wilson mentioned in earlier, it's like 
a, looking into a great dining hall or dance hall and, and pressing your face to the glass or looking up to, you know, from the bottom of a well filled with starlight and you're looking up the side of a vast, vast cathedral. And that's what the medieval man would have felt, right? There's this height to it, not just extension and outward, outward extension, but but height, it's you're looking mm -hmm. up um, at something that's structured and that's made and that's crafted by a creator. Not that just, you know, again, our our myth, our cultural myth is that it just exploded right into yeah. everything. And we still sometimes, though, we've been more affected by that than we realize because we still sometimes feel that way. We're just looking at kind of chaos, you know, spattered out there <laughs> versus something that's actually been lovingly crafted and made. Um, and that, and that really does affect, affect the way we go about our, our lives and how we view the, the things that have been created. And then of course, our fellow man is who are we and what is our place in all of this, uh, this cosmos. It's a little bit like the tyranny of the mundane, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I think Merlin in the books comes from uh, an era, maybe you said this, or maybe it was in the the trilogy itself, where it comes from an era where the 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 worlds were more intermixed, something like that. Like mm -hmm. like there was yeah. some separation that took place that we're living on the other side of. And then he and King Arthur, they lived when there was a lot more, uh, we might say, magic in the world or God's presence in the world, and what we might call a miraculous way. And so now we live in this very square and gray and you know, boxy kind of reality where it doesn't really seem like there's any, there's too much room for Red Seas parting or, you know, or, or, or arcs or anything like that. Like, oh no, that would never happen. But who's to say it couldn't have. It's just, we lack the imagination now because everything is so scientism if is that a word? I just made yeah. that up. So where is now <laughs> it is now I just made it. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> and that's the, that's, I think that's the power of, of, of the ransom trilogy as this echo from the past from 80 years ago, it's like, no, this is, we can think about er reality, not Narnia, mm -hmm. not some other dimension, like here, earth, where we live, we can think of things in this way. Exactly. Which is, and that's directly in opposition to what Weston and the NICE right. and the Belbury is about, right? It's the, and I think I mentioned this a lot in the book, but the materialistic reductionistic worldview, which is um, what our culture suffers from, right? Is that all there is, is matter, right? That's, that's all there is. We're just a bunch of, of cells, right? Put together in various ways, chemical reactions going on. Um, there's no, there's no deeper reality, which means that we can, we can do what we want with this matter, right? We can reform it. We, we can reshape it. We can change what reality is because there is no standard or no uh, nothing beyond the the material realm. It's infinitely malleable, and so we can just right take take dominion over it, but in a way that makes us the god of our little uh, little selves, right? So, which is what Belbury is trying to do, right? They want to remake reality, remake humanity, and in so doing, strip it of everything that truly makes it what it is. And we're seeing. I mean, I think we see the repercussions of that in our culture today is that if if that is true if that is all reality is is just the material world then mm -hmm. who's to say that you can't become a become a man or become a woman or i mean right what what right. what difference does it make it's just material it's just physic physical um cells that we can rearrange however we want and so and that and that is what again the, i think that this comes into play with um with Jane too, as we were talking about submission, Ransom has a has a comment where he says there's a there is a masculinity to it to which in comparison we are all feminine. Yeah. We all are called to submit, which is we are not gods, right? We we all are called to submit in a way um, to to our Creator. He made us. He made us a certain way, and he made the world a certain way. And there's far more to it than just uh, just matter and just cells. There's spiritual realities around every corner we everyone we meet is an eternal soul that is going to live forever either in eternal glory or eternal torment and as lewis says in another another place and so you know that should change the way mm. we treat everyone we meet um you you've never met i think he says somewhere you've never met an ordinary human being mm -hmm. because what even is that right everyone yeah. everyone is an 
an eternal soul. There's a spiritual reality there. And so it really does completely reorient your entire, um, I would say worldview, but also cosmology or cosmo cosmological view, right? Um, because it's it's everything. It includes everything down from the little little things, the little details up to the entire cosmos. And it fills in the gap between like theology, which I think is probably the top level, right? To to culture and let's say mm -hmm. ideology, worldview, like between worldview and, and theology is cosmology. And that that yeah. gap, that world, that that space has been completely occupied and our imagines have been completely occupied, as you as you very rightly said, by Hollywood for you know, since since um what maybe the War of the Worlds, maybe with H. G. Wells. Yeah. Right, it, where we think of things in a particular way, that's not biblical. <laughs> it's not Christian, and Christ is Lord over all, including our imaginations yes. about space. Yep, <laughs> exactly. So I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't get to, to say this, but the reason why Paralandra is is my favorite. There's a couple of reasons for it. First is um, that moment when I was like, "Is this Eden?" <laughs> right, <laughs> the first time I was like wait a minute so, something's familiar about this i wonder if we can talk a little bit about about that moment in, in the story and then yeah. of course yeah yeah well there's i mean obviously he he's pulling out all the stops on the edenic imagery throughout yeah. um the story and i love the moment when ransom wakes up he fall, so he falls asleep on the island the first night and he wakes up and he sees a tree with a dragon wrapped around coiled around its base mm -hmm. and at first he doesn't re he doesn't know where he is he doesn't remember and he thinks he's been sucked into a myth right he's it's just right out of right out of a myth and he doesn't know where he is he thinks he might be in the garden of the Hesper hesperides which is like a mythical kind of paradise garden and then he mentioned i think he even mentions eden at that point right because it just everything around him is right out of what you would imagine Eden to be like down to down to the little dragon wrapped around the tree. And, and so, yeah, it's very clear that he's pulling out all of that, which really, I mean, connects to both it being Venus, but also to the story that, that Lewis is telling in that, in that book. And then you have, you know, obviously you have the green lady and yeah. then the all on I mean, everything is just paralleling Genesis, paralleling that creation story. Uh, but what's what's interesting, I think what's so interesting about that is that, it, but it is post-incarnation, right? And being yeah. post-incarnation, it changes the entire story, that this is this is a different story. And so I think it's really interesting to see the differences between, that Lewis draws between this story and the, the Eden, the Genesis story, even down to, you know, how the, how Westerner, the unman is trying to tempt, tempt Eve, right? Um, versus mm -hmm. how Satan tempted um, tempted her because because uh, it doesn't doesn't quite work it doesn't quite work on her the same way right mm -hmm. um, because it is a different, it's a different world it's just a different place post incarnation and so he's trying to play more on her vanity um, and not physical vanity which this is a I think I I might mention this I can't remember but it's a parallel with um, in Milton's Paradise Lost um, which is a retelling of the Genesis story he has his Satan play on her physical vanity. Like she is, mm. she's beautiful. He has her look in this pool at herself and you know, she sees herself and actually like thinks she's, she's something, right? Mm -hmm. She's like, Oh, I'm so beautiful. And, but in, in this one, the unman tries to do that with her. He mm -hmm. try he takes her to a pool also and has her look at herself. Um, but she's terrified by it. Actually. It takes her a while to even be willing to look again because the concept of looking at herself is just totally foreign to her. She's never, uh, which I think in and of itself, you could write a whole paper on just like self-perception and, and you know, all that's mm -hmm. just great. Um, but this idea that she's never even considered looking at herself. So that doesn't really work. He has to change tax to a spiritual sort of vanity, a vanity of, uh, so he's telling her all these stories of women who sacrifice themselves for the good of their children or their husbands and he's twist twisting it to make it be like she has to disobey for the good of the king for the good of her posterity right and that somehow it's going to make her more noble and he's playing on her her vanity mm -hmm. in that way which is far more devastating and far more dangerous than just a mere physical, physical vanity. Uh, and I think, so I think that is just really, really interesting. And um, I mean, you could keep going more, more examples from, 
from that book on how he's paralleling with um, and contrasting with the Genesis story. But that's one of the things I just love, love about that book that I think is so well done and down to, again, the setting is just, it's just beautiful. And he does such a great job with his descriptions. Um, I think you said you left part of your heart on Paralandra. And I think who doesn't when they read it, honestly, who doesn't? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was reading it on the vacation I gave myself and, and I was reading the Kindle version. So I didn't really have much idea of where I was in the book. I stayed up until like four or five o'clock in the morning to finish it. I was like, I can't possibly put this book down. And even that has like a, a special treasured quality to me that I was so captivated by the book and so captivated by the story. I don't care that the sun's coming up. This was like in early June. So like five, six o'clock in the morning here in Arizona, it's starting to get light out. Like, I don't care. I can't let this, I can't let this moment go. And and I and what I tell people about Paralandra is that, you know, Genesis, the it wasn't written in the way that we understand literature today. Like the novel wasn't invented until Don Quixote, really, right? So we bring our modern minds to a narrative story like Genesis and expecting to find the level of detail and nuance and subtlety that we would find in a novel. And it's just not there because the form hadn't even been invented yet. And so there's a, there's a way in which so much imaginative power is required to put ourselves into the scene that it's almost impossible to know Am I imagining what's in there or am I, or, or is it actually there? And you don't want to make the mistake of imagining too much. And so the amazing part of Paralandra is that because he's contrasting with Genesis and he's able to tell a whole new story, he can use the themes of it and illustrate them on a totally other canvas. And he brought me right into that story in a way nothing else ever had. Like, that's why my heart is on Paralandra. It's like, yeah. I get it now. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And um, and then I guess the last thing I just want to talk about quickly is um, the the cosmic vision at the end of Paralandra as well. Um, I, and there's oh, nothing yeah. that I exactly nothing you and I could possibly <laughs> say would come close to it, but maybe you can speak about that for a minute. Yeah, I think so. It's it's amazing, really. It's a I, I can't remember who who said it. I'm I'm going to blank on who said it once now, uh, but the. The end, that ending, it's just the symphony, right? Lewis is just pulling out all the stops in terms of his prose and his description and just, it's just all there. And I really do think he's echoing Dante um, and Dante's Paradiso in the end, the end kind of climax of that, because you have a similar thing, like angels just singing and it's this circular sort of thing, right? There's these cycles. It's all circular, right? Mm-hmm. You have spheres throughout the cosmology and it makes sense because the circle kind of is a sign of infinity also, right? So you have this just never ending cycle of, of praise and, and glory. And so, I mean, my goodness. Yeah. He just, he just goes to town there. And I think it's hard, it's hard, honestly, to just almost talk about and describe mm-hmm. because it is so unique, I think, in literature. I think Paralandra in and of itself, the whole thing is unique in literature because yeah. when you think of of the plot, it's it's like I said before, is a lot of talking, a lot of conversations. Yeah. Heavy philosophical um, dialogue. And somehow, like, how does it just draw you in and you keep, yeah. keep like you said, stay up till 5 a.m. to finish it? Um, but he does it somehow. And there's, I mean, there is action. You know, I think he needs that action then at the end, you know, with, with um, when Ransom finally starts fighting the unmanned and you have those scenes but the majority of the book that's a relatively small percentage of the book is is taken up with that action is conversation and then you have this ending scene with that again the kind of the oyarsa oyarsa this this hymn it's almost like a hymn Mm -hmm. and so yeah it's hard hard to describe to someone who hasn't read it it's like yeah they, they sing this amazing him at the end <laughs> like okay uh, just go re- go read it for yourself it really is something something spectacular though and i think um again he really just the craft involved yeah. in in the writing of it and it captures it captures something something really amazing uh that is hard again i think since dante dante's parody so don't really see anymore you don't see um anyone do that and perhaps only lewis can get away with it <laughs> Yeah, but he turns up he turns up the volume on his on his imaginative ability, on his writing, literary ability, and his metaphor, and just just disappear on on this fantastic in terms of like fantasy, like journey through uh, journey through the cosmos, and just puts you right back down there at the end. Yeah, like what just happened? Yeah. yeah. 
Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Christiana. Uh, where would you like to send people to learn more about you? Also, are you working on any new books? Anything, anything in the works? Yeah. So I'm, I teach full time. So writing time can be a little hard to, to get around to. Um, but I am chipping away slowly, very slowly at research for a book on till we have faces. Um, mm. is that, that is the other, I'd say Lewis, Lewis book uh, of his fiction. That's a little more difficult for people to, to get into. And, and another one that in my research so far, there's not a lot written on. There's a lot of articles, good articles floating around. But as far as books, uh, again, there's, there's a couple reader guides out there, but it's, it's kind of funny. Again, the two reader guides I've found are kind of on the two ends of the spectrum between like high, high octane academic <laughs> caliber and a little bit more like high school reader guide esque mm -hmm. sort of thing. And again, I kind of, you know, my aim is the sweet spot, hopefully somewhere in the middle. So I, I think it's another one where there could be a, a good place for um, a, a helpful reader guide to that book, because it's another one of my favorites, that I think is absolutely just fantastic. And, and, and Lewis himself thought it was his best, uh, best novel. So so I'm working right now in the, in the research stages of that, just reading a lot and taking notes and, and gathering, gathering my thoughts. Um, I'm also trying, we'll see if it happens, to branch out into the fiction world here. So I have a novel that I've that I finished and I'm going to be kind of, you know, hoping we'll see the light of day here soon. And um, yeah, so just various, various writing projects that I'm working on. Uh, so I do have Facebook, Facebook page for Christiana Hale, author, also an Instagram. Christiana Hale author um, on Instagram, both places. I'm probably one of the worst people at updating <laughs> social media, but I'm trying to get better. So we'll, we'll see. But those are both places where I, I try to keep things um, updated as far as big, big news or, or interesting things. Also deeperheaven.com is where you can find the book um, as well as Amazon um, and other places where you, where you get your books. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, I was very excited to read your book and, and get so much from it. And I've been very grateful for this conversation as well. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it.